We've all heard the argument that we should be vegetarian to reduce our individual carbon footprints. Food makes up around a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions, and meat in particular has a large carbon price tag associated with it. So by cutting it out of our diets, we would each be emitting fewer harmful greenhouse gases. However, if we can't face being vegetarian, but only ate meat from local farms, then that would still be much better for the climate, right? To answer this question, we need to look at the price tag in greenhouse gas emissions associated with different kinds of food. Notice here that I'm saying greenhouse gas emissions, not carbon emissions, because there are other gases at play. Methane is significantly emitted by, for example, cows, but also bacteria living in rice paddies. We can bundle together the effects of lots of different polluting gases using the idea of CO2 equivalent emissions. This is effectively the amount of CO2 emissions required to have the same warming impact on the atmosphere as all the gases that you've lumped together. So methane, for example, is a potent greenhouse gas on short timescales. So one ton of methane emissions is 25 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. So one ton of methane emitted with one ton of CO2 would be 26 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. You get the idea. In a study in 2018, Poor and Nemechek analyzed the CO2 equivalent emissions of lots of different foodstuffs, ranging from beef and chicken right the way to apples and oranges. And then they compared them. The crucial thing to note is that the authors considered what's called the lifetime emissions of these foods. So all the emissions associated with a kilo of a particular food. That includes how you change the landscape to produce it, how you grow it, process it, transport it, and ultimately package and sell it. It's all the greenhouse gases emitted over the lifetime of a foodstuff, from farm to fork. I've taken a selection of foodstuffs and broken down their lifetime emissions in CO2 equivalent kilograms into these different processes. So let's go through them. First of all, how you change the land to produce the foodstuff. Beef and surprisingly chocolate are big emitters right out of the gates on this one. Chocolate, presumably because of the high dairy content, and cows require big pastures. Then let's add on the emissions associated with the feed given to farmyard animals. Emissions from fertilizers, farm machinery, the animals themselves, and other processes associated with growing the food. And for good measure, let's also chuck on the emissions associated with uh, processing. Already we can see that beef is herd and shoulders above all other types of food. Pound for pound, it has the largest carbon footprint. And other meat products are similarly high, though of all of them, poultry is the lowest. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have plant-based foods such as rice, tomatoes, bananas. However, just wait. Let's now add on the emissions associated with transport, both nationally and internationally, and see how much of a difference the food miles make. As you can see, it's a seriously small effect. Transport makes up, on average, less than 10% of the lifetime greenhouse gas emissions of most foodstuffs. And for beef, it's just 0.5%. When we add on the final contribution to the lifetime emissions of food, that associated with retail and with packaging, you can see just how little an impact the food miles of a food has on its total carbon footprint. But how can that be? Some foods like avocados must have huge transport costs, as after all they're flown in from the other side of the world, only to meet their ignominious end on some Instagram influencer's toast. Not me, by the way. I do have an Instagram, which you should follow, but I don't like avocados. They're trash unless they're in guacamole. Fight me, nerds. Well, actually, very, very little food is transported by plane. Poor and Nemechek report that food transport by planes only accounts for 0.16% of all food miles. 60% of food miles are via water, and shipping is 50 times less polluting in terms of the greenhouse gases than planes. Shipping's actually very carbon efficient. So most of the foods that you think of as being very exotic and likely flown in are probably taken by boat. For what it's worth, the foods that are airlifted tend to be highly perishable things like berries and asparagus, things with short shelf lives. If these are grown far from where you live, then avoiding them will make something of a difference to your carbon footprint via your food miles. But by buying local meat, how much are you reducing your personal carbon footprint? According to one study conducted in the EU, by at most 6% of your total food footprint. If instead you were to cut out all dairy and meat and eggs from your diet, so go vegan, then according to that same study, you would reduce your food footprint by 83%. I'm not advocating that everyone should become vegan, although it definitely would be better for the environment if everyone did, and I myself am only vegetarian. For what it's worth, I don't miss eating meat, apart from sweaty kebabs, and I don't view it as a hardship 
at all. My diet has definitely improved by turning veggie. The point I'm trying to get across is that buying local meat and reducing your food miles makes only a tiny dent in your personal carbon footprint. Don't be fooled into thinking that you've made a significant contribution to the fight against climate change by doing so. <coughs> if you want to actually reduce your personal carbon footprint, then you need to reduce the amount of meat and dairy you're eating. This doesn't have to be all the way. You could, for example, eat meat just on the weekends or just give up beef. As we've seen, it's by far the worst emitter. But just eating local meat for local people, I'm afraid, isn't gonna cut it. What else can we do as individuals about climate change? Well, I've made a whole video about that. And also about how individual action isn't enough. And another about what you maybe shouldn't do. Links in the end screen. That's actually it for this video. I just wanted to do a quick one today, answering this common question. If you enjoyed it, definitely check out my other videos on climate. They're linked in the description and on the end screen. This video was largely based on an excellent article on our world in data, which is linked below. I basically just animated a bunch of figures from it and filled in some gaps. Check it out if you'd like to learn more from a fantastic source. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Well, you won't, because I'm not going to be appearing on camera until I can get a bloody haircut. Seriously, I look like the bassist from Guitar Hero 3.